College athletics is incredibly important, and I was, I was talking today doing another interview, actually, and remembering again how important football is, how important basketball is, how important all the other sports are, and they're important for a couple of things. One is student athletes are a great population. They're individuals who really come and get help get an education because of athletics. That's incredibly important. It provides a pathway to a college education for many individuals who might have had difficulty otherwise. So that component just in itself is important. And then competition is really fun. I wasn't good enough to be a varsity athlete athlete in college, but I played intramurals, multiple intramurals, because I really enjoyed the chance to compete and measure my skills against others. There's something really fundamental about that. And sports is a great unifier. Um, you go to any city in the country and get in an Uber or a cab, and you can talk to your driver usually about what's happening with their local team. It's a universal language we can all talk about. And in a conference like the Big Ten, you know, football is really important. People plan their summers, they plan their falls, uh, winters, around what's happening in football. So it's really a big part of the community. It's a big part of the identity of the Big Ten, and particularly from the Michigan State Spartans, is a big part of who we are. So I take it very seriously. It's one of the reasons I came here, and I think trying to find ways to do it safely has been a challenge, but I think it's an important thing that we have to take on uh, as an institution and as a conference. I was president of Stony Brook University in New York uh, for 10 years. For that, I was vice chancellor for research at Washington University in St. Louis, and I was a faculty member there for a couple of decades. I had a joint appointment in molecular microbiology in the Department of Medicine. Um, I taught medical students uh, as well as graduate students. Uh, I had a laboratory where I did biomedical research, primarily related to emerging infectious diseases. And I also uh, served, did clinical work uh, in Barnes Hospital as an infectious disease specialist. It's SARS coronavirus 2, uh, is what we refer to it as and it's a member of the coronavirus family. This is the third outbreak we've had, serious outbreak with coronaviruses. We've known about coronaviruses for decades. We've known they cause common cold and other mild infections. But starting with the first SARS, that was the first epidemic of a coronavirus with very severe disease. And as the name suggests, it was severe acute respiratory syndrome. SARS was the name given to it. And that was what we now call COVID-1, SARS-CoV-1. And that disease spread out from China um, caused worldwide impact, um, but was ultimately controlled and was controlled by classic public health measures. So you put people basically into quarantine, you isolated their contacts, and by doing that, and also by making sure that healthcare people were protected, because a lot of the outbreak was from patients to healthcare people, by doing both those things, we were able to stop that outbreak. And then a number of years later, Mideast Respiratory Syndrome virus was recognized, MERS. It's another coronavirus that started in the Mideast, as the name suggests, also had a worldwide spread. There's been three more outbreak since that first outbreak. And each time though, again, standard public health measures of quarantine have controlled it. Both those were lethal diseases, so both those killed as much as 20 to 30 percent of the people who were infected. So they're more deadly essentially than we now know for COVID-19. COVID-19 was first reported, as you know, from Wuhan, China, uh, late in 2019. When I first heard about the disease, I thought it was going to be another SARS coronavirus-like illness, and I thought it would probably have high mortality potentially, but be controlled by public health measures. It became pretty clear to me as things continue that that wasn't the case. This was a very different virus in the way it behaved, and it's really pretty unique. So as what we know about it now is this is a virus that's very transmissible, more transmissible than SARS and MERS was, so it's easy to get it by being in the same room with somebody transmits by aerosol, transmits by droplets uh, much more effectively. At the same time, there's an incredible spectrum of disease, and more maybe than I've ever seen before. So young people, for example, tend to not get symptoms or to get very mild symptoms. As you go up the age mark, then the disease becomes more and more severe. So by the time you're in the 80s, um, there's a 25% plus mortality for people in that age group. So that's very different than many diseases we've seen. Influenza has higher mortality among infants, higher mortality among the very older, but kind of a much smoother pathway. This disease is very much just going up like this in terms of how people uh, deal with it. This is a, a, a pandemic that we haven't seen before. So really since 1918, I think, or HIV, have we seen a pandemic with this kind of public health implications. So it's changing everything we do. It's why I'm doing this interview with the mask on. It's why all you all are masked. Um, because we really, the way you prevent transmission right now, the only way to do it is by stopping physical transmission of the virus right now. So we can do it by wearing these masks, staying socially distanced, keeping our hands washed because we don't want spread of droplets that transmit it that way. Um, all these things are effective. We know they're effective when we do them. The challenge for the country, the challenge for all of us has been getting everybody to adopt those measures because if we do this we can reduce transmission significantly. But if we don't do it, we see transmission and we're seeing it right now of course uh, in Michigan. 
I felt pretty strongly that the measures we'd put in place would allow teaching to take place safely. So the social distancing, the way we'd mapped out the classrooms, the mandatory wearing of masks uh, inside buildings as well as outside for us, but inside buildings. Um, and I think the things we'd done to clean, to direct traffic flow, all those things, and the de-densification of campus. So I think all those things we did uh, would have made it a safe environment. But what was, I was really concerned about was this student-to-student -student transmission issue. So I thought we had it under control for potential student to faculty, faculty to student staff transmission. I thought we had that under control in teaching. What I was concerned about was, did we have the ability to stop widespread transmission from student to student in the dorms? And the conclusion I came to was, with the protocols we'd put in place, Place, and that most people had put in place, um, we probably didn't have that capability. So I was very concerned about on and off campus transmission. So by reducing the number of students on campus, uh, we've reduced that on campus risk. So right now the outbreak we're seeing in the area is not really on our campus, it's really off campus that's taking place, it's off campus students primarily that are being affected. Um, so I think we did solve that problem, but we weren't able to solve the broader problem of what's happening off campus, and that's what we're working on now. So the spit test is a, a test, so as opposed to the standard nasal swab, uh, it's actually a test that measures presence of virus in saliva. And it was developed, um, the one we're using right now for this uh, test was developed by a, a Michigan State University investigator. Um, he's developed a PCR test using new primers. So PCR is about amplifying the nucleic acid from the virus. He's developed one that's more sensitive, he believes, um, than the standard ones that are being used for nasal pharyngeal. So it allows you to have fewer uh, copies of virus in the saliva and still detect a positive. So it's really simple. You just have to spit in something, transfer it to another container, lock it up, and then a PCR is done and results are back in 48, 72 hours, whatever that number is. And again, the way we can test multiple people is by pooling. So in other words, we could take a group of, let's say, 10 people, pool their samples into one tube, run that tube. If that tube is completely negative, then we know none of those 10 people were infected. If that tube is positive, then you go back and you break down those 10, retest the individuals, or retest them in groups of five, whatever works better, and then, when you, you, then you'll be able to identify what the positive one, two, three, whatever it was, what those ones were. So it's actually a great way to screen large numbers of people. So we can do certainly 1,000 a day, uh, get up to capacity of doing a thousand tests a day much faster and much easier because if you have to nasal swab each person that takes time maybe you can do a hundred tests an hour um, with this test we can do many more tests and process them so it has a number of advantages but right now as I said it's not FDA approved so we can't mandate people use it we can't again uh, use it as to make a diagnosis it has to be confirmed by a conventional test I think there will be a vaccine developed I think progress is being made um, what I can't tell you for sure is how effective that vaccine will be. I can't tell you whether it'll be a vaccine like you get for measles. So if you get the measles vaccine, get your several shots, um, you're probably protected from measles for life, essentially, and we know that works. Um, if you have flu, on the other hand, every year you need to get a new flu shot, right? And we know the protection is not perfect. It reduces probably your chance of getting severe disease and provides some protection against getting infected, but it's not an absolute protection. So the question is, where will the coronavirus vaccine flow onto that, uh, on that pathway? So will it be effective in really stopping people from getting disease, or will it make you get milder disease? Either one of those things is a good thing, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't knock a vaccine that did what the flu vaccine does. That would be great. But I think that will change the dynamics. The second thing that I think is going to change is I think we'll get better antiviral drugs, better drugs to actually treat the disease. I think that will be helpful to us and I think that will make a difference. And so that may change what's a fatal disease into a non-fatal disease. And I think those drugs are being developed, I think they'll be out there and I think that will change things. So even if we continue to have low level epidemics or low level number of cases, I think that will make a difference. So I think those two things are going to happen. I have a lot of faith in our biomedical research, both in the United States and around the world, that will deliver something that can do that. The other thing I think that's going to be important is better diagnostics and more point of care. So what we really need is like the Abbott test that's been described, if that works, a $5 test you can do right on site. So it makes it much easier to test people, to get them isolated and quarantined, uh, and to make sure they'll get the medical health care they need and so on. That type of widespread testing will make a difference. No test ever prevented somebody from getting disease per se, right? It's not a vaccine, but what it does is gives you much more information on who to isolate, who's vulnerable, who's not vulnerable, and you can make much better decisions. So I think all those three things are going to happen and change how we deal with this. But for right now, in the near term, this is the right thing to do because this is really the way in which we prevent transmission is doing this. But the testing and other things will help. Um, we had some very difficult decisions to make uh, when we talked about football and the postponement. 
Um, there were some major concerns we had about our testing protocols and whether we could really guarantee that athletes who stepped out on the field, both practice field and competition field, were going to be safe. We had some concerns about that. And we had concerns about what happens to students who have had, student athletes who have had COVID-19, and what is it safe for them re to return? And there were unanswered questions about that, particularly in the area around myocarditis, this inflammation in the heart that we know can occur in association with viral diseases. I think during this time, we haven't stopped working on all of this. People have been working overtime on all of this to help us answer those uncertainties, to help us be in a position where we can come back to football, to the families, to the players, to the coaches, to the trainers and say we've developed a protocol that we think can keep people safe in doing it. We got the word and uh, I received the text and it said we got the green light and I was really I was really excited about it. It was it's go time. <laughs> Not so much of a, of a relief. I don't believe in relief. Uh, we knew that we wanted to play. We knew that at some point we would get a chance to play. We just didn't know when. And so we have been relentlessly preparing uh, for this opportunity. So when the opportunity came, uh, then we were ready to go. Safety has always been a priority. Uh, just want to thank uh, the Big Ten uh, Medical Task Force uh, for all that they've done to, to help us get to this point. Uh, want to thank the, the support that we've gotten from all of our fans. They're looking forward to enjoying Spartan football again. Go Green. What a great scene for college football. Spartan Stadium. If there was a game where we were ever ready to play, it was that one. Um, we had been hyped for previous games before, but we really had a deep belief that we could win that football game. We felt like our team in 99 was just different, uh, especially different than previous teams that we had had. A little background, Coach Saban would always put in some sort of trick play to Michigan week. Um, he always liked to have that in his back pocket. We'd always practice it during the week. You never really think it's going to get called in the game, number one. And number two, if it does, you never think it's going to work because it never works in practice, not even once. Um, so we put in the flea flicker and the signal is actually uh, scratching your armpit as if you had fleas. Uh, <laughs> you know, we make them simple and easy to remember. Uh, so that signal comes in and I had to just, I stood there and paused for a second and almost did a double take because there was no way that, that I believed that we were actually going to attempt to run this play. I handed it off to little John Flowers. He turned around and kind of tossed the ball back to me and it spun in a way that the strings landed exactly in my hand where they needed to be. I didn't have to adjust them at all because I really didn't have time to do that. The defense was kind of bearing down on me. Uh, but I let it go. I got it out there where, where Plaxico could run under it and uh, we started the game off with a pretty big play. The rules down here, straight ahead, no fair dodging. Duck it. Touchdown, Michigan State. Epstein from 56 yards out. All right, we're done here. Long enough, and it's good. 56 yard field goal, and Lloyd Carr smiles as the Wolverines get on the board for the first time this afternoon. They've been able to move it with the pass, and that's what they're going to do here on third down. Almost intercepted. Amp Campbell. Broken the ball and almost made the pick. Well, and I'll tell you what, Amp's got to be a little disappointed himself. That was to the house. Great football all over the country today. Head, watch that. Burks going deep, looking for Burris. He's got a step. Plexico Burris has the catch. All the way down to the 30 yard line. He got off to a slow start this year, had an injured thumb. Came into this game with 22 catches. That's a 49-yard game. This will be a 39-yard attempt for Paul Ediger. And the kick is good. Hey. Going deep. Knight has the catch. Knight inside the 20. Touchdown, Michigan. One-yard touchdown, Henson to Marcus Knight. An excellent field position that they didn't take advantage of. Here they go again to the big tight end, McCoy. Ivory McCoy still on his feet. 
McCoy all the way down to the 26. This has plenty of distance, and it's good. Officially a 43-yard field goal. And so with 117 remaining in the first half, the Spartans take the lead again by three. Third down and nine for Michigan, and it's almost picked off. Richard Newsom had his hands on the ball and couldn't hold on. Third down and a long nine. And Henson can't escape. And there he is again, Robert Smith. Burke has time, looks into Scott. Scott's got the catch. Touchdown, Spartans. The whole stadium's rocking. 19-yard touchdown, Burke to Scott. I tell people all this all the time when I'm talking about this particular game. I enjoyed just watching our defense play this game because they smothered uh, the Michigan offense. You could see, especially in Drew Henson, he was seeing ghosts back there. Um, I noticed on one of the plays that out of the shotgun, he took a seven-step drop, which you never do. Um, it really just throws all of your offensive timing out of rhythm. Um, but Robert and Julian Peterson, all those guys, you could just go right down the list. Um, they just harassed the Michigan offense all afternoon. Season locking in on the receiver. Makes the easy pick. It's third down and long for Michigan State. To the corner. Burns, touchdown, Spartans. Mexico Burris having the game of his life. Third ranked Michigan right now just being riddled. Still plenty of time left in this game. The parties better not begin yet. No, not just yet. There's still plenty of time. Brady's going to come back at the helm again. I think that's a good move. They need five. They've got it. Marcus Knight picks up the first down to the 35. So gamble and they succeed. And, they, and they, that was the first fourth down conversion they've made this year. Brady throws it, has it complete to Shea. Shea's inside the 10 to the 5 to the 3 yard line. Aaron Shea. Thomas. Down close. Still no signal. <laughs> he just got buried in humanity. And the ref Touchdown, I, I, Michigan. <laughs> I think the maturity of our team. You know, as you look through the, the, the second half, third quarter, fourth quarter, the maturity of our team where we might have kind of let that one go and rested after we had such a big lead, we really knew that they were going to come back. It was going to be a fight until the end, and we were prepared mentally more than anything to, to handle that and come out on top. 17-yard line actually stepped out on the 19. Gary Scott with a big catch and another first down for Michigan State. Here goes Moss. Moss inside the five, still on his feet. Touchdown to Ron Moss, the fullback for Michigan State. Just a red shirt freshman. The Ron Moss, who scored on his very first career carry for 42 yards out, scores here from 14. Pump fake going to the corner. To, Terrell is open. Touchdown, Michigan. David Terrell with his ninth catch, a 19-yard scoring strike. Big games like that that you want to win so desperately, they're never easy. I mean, I remember uh, Nick Saban telling me one-on-one -on -one in his office, every game comes down to the last two minutes, so you have to be prepared for that going in. You're not going to be able to get up by 30 points and just kind of call it a day, and especially not against Michigan. Uh, they were ranked number three in the country. We were 11th. Uh, we were both undefeated. And there was no doubt that they wanted it just as bad as we did. So it was going to come down to who made the most plays. And again, you know, to, to be able to just kind of keep the baseball hat on and, and let the defense seal the win, uh, I wasn't prepared mentally to, to have that happen. So I assumed that Michigan would score and, and we'd have to go back out there one more time. And, um, you know, again, we made the play. I mean, it was uh, kudos to our offensive staff for calling a, a pass play because, you know, we had to be aggressive, I think. We couldn't just kind of try and run out the clock. Uh, we needed that first down, and it would have been a safe call to try and keep it on the ground. But I remember we called comebacks, uh, one on each side of the field, Gary and uh, Plexico. I just went to the left because I'm left-handed. It's, it's more natural to see over there. 
and I threw one out there, and he, of course, uh, it's tough to cover Plexico, so he just got some separation, created some space for him, and I was able to put it between him and the sideline. Go for the throw, go for the kill right here. They go for the first down, and they get it. 34-31, the Spartans beat the Wolverines of Michigan.